J. Dr. Canadian here with um, Nathan McConnell, a uh, creator of Growing Up Aspie, a comic about hashtag relatable what it's like to be on the autism spectrum. Um, and today we uh, have him here to talk about his work, his life, his family, what it's like to be a male on the autism spectrum and, you know, some general insight and just like have a regular conversation for Autism Acceptance Month and which should be every month, right? Yeah, I mean, what? why limit it? Because apparently justice can only be served once a month or once a year. I think That's they do that to, to several groups. <laughs> so some people just get a day. Oh yeah, that's a shame. That's a shame. Why can't it be every day? <laughs> you know, and, and that's what's funny is if you participate in Autism Acceptance Month uh, or even Autism Acceptance Day, all the comments that I get on any any project I do for that day is it should be every day, and I'm like, well, it should be, and it technically is. I mean, we're all doing this every day, um, but that's the day that we're trying to take back from a certain group of people. So, yeah, you know, that's it kind of highlights it. Maybe right. it kind of highlights we do, it. We do need to focus a little bit on that day specifically to alleviate some of that. But yeah, it should be every day. Yeah. So, um, tell me a little bit about your family. You have a, you had a lot of cool stuff happen in the last few years with your family, right? Uh, yeah. I, um, me and my wife got married a few years back. Um, and then, Last year, a little bit before last year, uh, we uh, announced that we were pregnant and um, went through the whole shindig of having a little boy. Um, and so now we uh, we are a big happy family and uh, something that I thought would never be possible a couple of years back sitting sitting in my you know, family's house and going, well, no one's going to give me a job and never going to get married and I'm never going to have kids. And, you know, all this stuff just felt really out of reach. And then all of a sudden, you know, a lot of it had to do with her help. Um, I just started getting jobs finally, and they started realizing that I did good work. Um, ironically, of course, it had to be, uh, they were in dire need of an employee you know that's usually how we get in is somebody makes the mistake of hiring us or has to hire us and then they're like oh they're actually really good at their job yeah um, imagine that right imagine that imagine out, somebody out... very focused on that particular topic and very folk and very passionate about that imagine that they do good work in that top uh, in that no. field it's, you know, they, I was just talking about this with, with somebody else, but um, they make the mistake of thinking the person who talks the best is going to be best for the job. And that's the whole point of interviewing is, um, you know, how impress me with your words. And it's like, yeah, because that's that's going to let you know whether or not I can do graphic design or, you know, booking or whatever else. Or if uh, you're reliable. Like, how, how are they going to know you're actually reliable? You can just lie your way through an interview. But autistic people can't lie for garbage half the time. Right. Well, that's the funny part is that everyone's always like, oh, we'll be honest. And it's like, no, what they mean is <laughs> be what they want to hear and make it sound honest. Um, and, of course, like, yeah, like you're saying, we're not super good at lying. So I'm, I'm just honest with them. I throw up red flags anyway, and then they're like, so uh, is this resume made up? Um, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. why? Uh, totally. Why are you asking that? And they're like, oh, that's a, we ask everybody that. I'm like, no, no, you don't. You do not ask everybody that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just so awkward. But uh, yeah, back to, back to that. Um, uh, Candace has been a huge help in, um, I, I don't want to say normalizing me. I did a comic about that. Her existence makes people go, oh, so he's not a axe murderer, you know, 
um, you know, I've been uh, I've been at stores uh, where she would just walk in, and security would just part. You know, the employees who were supposed to watch me and go, you know, what is he up to? She'd show up and then go, oh, and walk off. Um, so it's it's funny because an icebreaker for neurotypical people seems to be, oh, he's he's uh, married. Oh, so he's not, he's not, you know, he's not this horrible monster person that I'm assuming he is right now. So, um, yeah. And then now, now I have my, my, you know, Logan, you know, my son. So we're, yeah. we're like a big family and it's, it's even funnier because they're like, oh, he's got, oh, okay. Um, he's fine, I guess, you know, um, but yeah, in an interview, Ironically enough, um, if I bring those two things up, they're like, oh, okay, you know, so clearly he's okay enough to, you know, do these things. And I'm like, well, I'll use that to my advantage, I guess. <laughs> like, yeah. because when it was just me, it was sort of like, oh, weird guy. The yeah. end, you yeah. know. And um, when you when you actually go, oh, people have chosen to interact with me and make me part of their lives. Uh, they go, oh, OK, so so, you know, this is doable, I guess. Um, but anyway, if I say, you know, a lot, a lot it's because I'm exhausted. But <laughs> oh, yeah, I hear that, man. I uh, um, <laughs> yeah, it sounds a lot like, you know, this is just my experience of autistic males. It might that they tend to have a lot of trouble masking like whether they want to or not they're just really hard like they can't they can't it's almost like they can't do it if they wanted you know what i mean well for me um i can do it really well and i can do a type a personality if i want to and i can do all these different mm -hmm. things and I've, I've mastered it the problem is um some of the people that I learned how to mimic growing up were either liars or cheaters or, um, you know, things like that. Not that I took on those traits. It's that you take on the mannerisms of how they hold themselves, how they present themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, so people are like, oh, well, he's lying. And I'm like, no, I'm just making the face that the person I grew up with makes when they're trying to be convincing. Um, so we we have a tendency mm -hmm. to, to pick up the wrong um, visual cues, the the wrong facial expressions, the wrong body movement, um, and at the same time, I also have this fun um, little bit where in middle school, I suddenly went from a Christian school to a um, majority minority high uh, middle school where I was this awkward nerdy white kid in the middle of, you know. A um, bunch of people who didn't really like me at first, and um, over time through middle school and through high school, I started to mimic the people who were there, you know, and uh, to not get bullied so much, I started to act a little bit more dangerous or threatening, or um, you have to give off the persona of don't mess with me, um, and unfortunately that sticks, so... Mm. Um, especially with my hat, you know, uh, uh, people just sort of fear me sometimes. And, yeah. and then when you bring it up, they go, oh, no, 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 oh, no, not at all. And I'm going, oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've talked to you a few, quite a few times and it seems like you are, you are a very, very friendly person. And, uh, it seems like you enjoy conversations on online with people. But, um, it's like, it's just, that's just, I can relate to that a lot. Like, like, a lot of the socialization I get is from watching Clerks 2. I, I, I mimicked, right. I mimicked, I don't know if you've seen that movie, but I mimicked, uh, uh, Randall's responses. And that's how I almost, almost how I learned to act. And, right. um, how I learned to do satire-ish comedy. Um, so it's, it, it's just like, you kind of, you kind of, we don't have this, 
idea of instinctually of how to respond to people so we kind of got to watch other people do it and if that's if all you're watching is reality tv that's all you know i mean that's not all i watch i mean you know well and and that's what i mean you know for me um you know there were certain figures that you need in your life growing up that were not there for me um Mm -hmm. and so i would watch you know uh, christopher reeves as superman um and you know various other characters uh darian from sailor moon um kind of like the goku dragon ball z and you know picked up these these aspects that i like i did a comic about this um picked up these aspects that i liked about these these characters and kind of made them part of my my persona and i had somebody one time tell me that i was being inauthentic and i was like no no, this is the same thing you guys do. This is exactly yeah. what y'all do. You grow up, you mimic the people around you until it takes the shape of who you are. Yeah. I'm doing the exact same thing, but I'm having to make the decision to make the right facial expressions, to make the right body movements, to, to use the right word choice, um, and to show you through those things who I am on the inside. Right. I am on the inside has been molded just like you, by these people that you you know that you're taking after, um, I just have to go through the extra steps of sh- of finding a way to show you who that is. Because um, yeah. the, ac- the accusation all the time, especially when, you know, like I said, I learned how to mimic from people who were inauthentic. Sometimes um, the accusation is always, "Well, you you know, be yourself. You you're not being authentic." And it's like, no, I am. I'm just on a high wire being shot at with a whole bunch of paintballs during a windstorm. Because, yeah. You know, I'm trying to juggle all of these things um, and waiting for all of the balls to drop and someone to snip the wire because it's, it's like a continuous ballet of they're going to find me out. Yeah. Um, there's also that one phrase. I'm a combined effort of everyone I've ever known in my life. I don't remember who said that, but that is just, it just stuck with me. And it's like, how can you be authentic, as they say, if you really are just, just a conglomeration of everybody who's helped you become who you are, for better or worse? Like, when we're manipulated, which, you know, a lot of us are, and a lot of us, uh, as disabled people, we probably have the, uh, and people who take things for face value, um, we're probably manipulated and uh, tortured more than most of the population. Um, right. And, I, you know, I, I don't think it can get any more um, face value than uh, than uh, autistic an autistic person. That doesn't mean we're all good people. I think a lot of us are. But what you see is what you get. There's really no, we can't really hide very well. Well, right. Ulterior motive is is um, difficult, if not um, pointless to us. I mean, it's sort of like, and that's the funny part is we're always accused of having one. And it's always like, oh, we've got this, you know, uh, I'd like to do A. You're just saying you want to do A because you want to do B. What are you talking about? Why is B even being brought up right now? I want to do A. Well, obviously he wants to do B. It's like, mm, mm, okay, you're not hearing me. Um, Yeah, I I just want to do the one thing. Yeah, I I, I think that um, people on the spectrum might be accused of that because when a neurotypical does that, it's presumed that that neurotypical means that particular thing hence the communication gap between autistics and neurotypicals it's really important to just take us literally at face value even though that's not the way you normally function well that's not the way we normally function to ask indirectly we usually just ask very directly you know and then it leaves us trying to um reverse engineer okay what is this person thinking of me um like you have to sit there and go okay clearly they think i'm up to something what could that something be um and then it turns into that game show where you're just like (laughs) taking guesses um 
Yeah. Like as a, I think I did that comic the one time where I was I was working at this photo editing place, and there was two women I was working with, and I jokingly said, you know, hey gals, you know, um, just because I, you know, I'd heard it somewhere. I was watching a nineteen forties movie or something, That's and so they kind of looked at me and go. <laughs> No one says gals unless, and then they leaned in and squinted, and I'm like, trying to do the math, like, I don't, <laughs> I don't understand. So I'm like, okay, could it mean this? Could it mean that? And I, I, I even asked them point blank. I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. So of course I do the comic. This is more than ten years after the fact. And I've got you know, some women telling me, oh, it's it's sexist. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, I, of course, I looked into that. And then somebody was like, oh, they think you're gay. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and then a whole bunch of random other so? things. What so, is, like, like, if you're introducing to yourself as to two women as gay, if that was even the thing, then what's right. the big deal? It's not like well, you that's can... That's what I'm saying. Like, it's all not like you're options, flirting with them. Right. All the options they were giving me were sort of like what I'm used to, where somebody's already made the assumption that I'm some horrible monster person who's who's wrong for some reason. And oh, um, yeah. I was just sort of like, OK, I'm just never going to use that word again. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I'll just avoid the whole the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think um, like like we were saying, you know, when it comes to um the communication between us, the ulterior motive thing is like, for me, that's a, just one of the biggest things because I have never, almost never had one. I'm not going to say I've never had one because, of course, we learned. We've we all learned, had issues, too. Yeah. You know, we I mean, learned, we've all done things where we should We learn have. how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, the majority of the time, it's literally just been, um, I pay someone a compliment. Why are you doing that? What do you want? I'm like, no, like that was that was it. Um, I just appreciate you. Do right, you want me to uh, stop? Right. One time, um, I was uh, I was at a self checkout uh, at one of the grocery stores around here, and the guy in front of me left behind sixty dollars in in the change thing because uh, he paid in cash, and he walked off. So I'm not paying attention. I walk up, I look down, and sure enough, there's sixty bucks, and I'm like, oh no, you know. So I look around, I pull the money out, and I'm looking at all, you know, trying to find out where he went. And the two women who were working the self-checkout were angrily judging me, like, I'm just going to take this guy's money. And I'm, I'm like, no, where did he go? Do you see where he's at? And um, they're just shaking their head and squinting at me, like, I'm just going to take the money. I'm asking you where he went. So they just kept judging me well it turned out there was well a you should have judged them for not giving it back to him they were in ample space to do so well they didn't they didn't notice it until i picked it up so all of a sudden i'm in possession of it and they're just standing there going i mean you know? but either way that's I, their I found problem him. for not noticing so they right. should have passed the buck him. to you no pun intended right i found him and i i, I walked in his direction and he he did the whole check the pockets, turn around, you know, kind of freaked out. And then he saw me and I'm like, yeah, I've, I've, I've got your money. And I start walking towards him. The response was not gratitude. The response was, why? The look of just why, why are oh you giving God. this back to me? And I'm going, okay, not. You could have okay. just pocketed it. Why are people right. so... Why are people it was sort like of this? like he was looking at me and he was going, based on how you present, why are you giving this back to me? It was sort of an accusation of, you look like someone who would pocket the money. And I'm sort but of But you like, didn't? I was like, um, okay. And he didn't even, he did not say thank you. He just sat there, stared at me like, huh. How dare you do the honest thing? Right. Without well, asking it, it for sort of like five he was of confused. It. He was confounded. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, well, have a nice day. Um, and I, the funniest part about that is I went and got, uh, went and got in my car, and someone under my windshield left a you are blessed 
for the for the rest of your days or something like that. Aww. And I was like, well, how did they even have time? You know what I mean? How did they know whose car it was? How did they even have time to get this on here without me seeing it? And does this have anything to do with what just happened? I don't um, know. But, but yeah, I that's, mean... I think that's the majority of the autistic experience is we are we are working overtime to present ourselves a certain way and they're working overtime to misunderstand what we're trying to present to them. And I don't think it's even intentional. I just think it's a it's just a like it's just that we can all work part time to not confuse to not confuse each other. You know, that's that's how it should work. Right. And, you know, we, I think we, um, we want to fit in so much. We want to be liked so much sometimes that we do all the work to try and make that communication work correctly. Um, yeah. and I've seen if, if I, if there are any neurotypical people watching at the moment, I think my advice in, in that situation would be, um, do not just ram the car directly into the wall, allow yourself to back up and go, hold on a second, maybe I'm wrong here. Um, because in situations like that guy, in situations like those co-workers of mine, um, and, and the thousands of other times things like that have happened, there is no fixing it at that point. They often just shut down and they just, you know why, you know, and then we play the you know why game. And then <laughs> that's it, you know. You um, know why. You know. Really, I don't. I don't like, know I don't why don't you're upset. Know. I don't know why, you know. I mean, if I did something wrong, you should just be like, oh, yeah. let give me a chance to fix it. You know, I'll apologize and try to make it better. Right. And, and I, you know, if I, if I go on my Facebook messages right now and just typed in, you know, you know what you did into the search function, it would probably be almost everybody on my friends list. <laughs> because it's sort of like you know I'm like I don't I really don't just throw me a bone you know what I mean I really yeah. don't know what we're talking about um that's the unfortunate yeah. side uh to being on the spectrum sometimes like we can be like in these even in the mental health field like I'm still like did my boss actually mean um do you have time to do this today or did she, is she trying to imply that um, she's giving me a deadline for this today? Or is she saying, um, can you have this done to me by this time? Like, I, and I won't know, but, like, I'll be like, I'll be like, I don't know if I have time today, I don't know. Or, like, um, how can I help you but not exhaust myself? I don't know, you gave me about 60 other things. I'm not sure if you know about that, that I'm still working on. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's, like, being clear about your expectations with us is always important. Like, be like, this is what I need you to do. This is when I need it. And don't say, if you want to. Say, this is what I expect of you. Right. You know what I mean? That's all you have to do. You just, we, like, I don't know about you, but I find it, like, really validating when somebody recognizes that, um commands with compliments when it comes to employers is the best way to get us to comply and i mean we're not going to be uncompliant but it's just you're going to confuse us I'm, i mean i'm sure you can relate you know um i was just thinking there there are um there are certain phrases that just just they go over right your past head. me um uh, or it, it not even just over the head through the ear completely certain yeah. missing like um anytime i've met someone i know in public and they say the the phrase um um oh well you know i'm 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 in a bit of a hurry i take that as a how's the weather you know what i mean it's not solid to me um yeah if they say i can't talk there you go yeah you know? um or if they're making the motion like I gotta go, I'm in a bit of I'm in a bit of a hurry. Sure, but if they just sprinkle it in as if I'm just supposed to sop that up and go, oh, they don't have time to talk. I'm not gonna get that. So same same yeah. deal in that situation where um, I did a comic about that too. Um, the trash needs to be taken out. 
Good for the yeah. track. You know what I mean? Good Who's for the track. Do? <laughs> He's got stuff going on. Um, because you need to be taken out is, like on a date. Right. You know, there yeah. there is no character tied to that statement. There is no who or what or why or whatever. Could you um, take out the trash, honey? Right. Or could you take out the trash, brother? Could you take right. out the trash, you know, Danielle? Um, or hey, Nathan? You, hey, can you or do that? In a, you know, that's that's and that's the thing is is that's fine. But if you're, you know, I've been in situations where we're in a room full of people and the command is, this needs to happen. Yeah. And it's sort of like the the cup of drawing straws in the middle of the table, but no one's touching it. Because that's not a command. If you said, hey, you need to do this. You take this part, you take this part. That works. But if you just go, oh, this needs to happen. Uh, especially us, but even neurotypicals, when you just that uh, they don't seem to notice that even for themselves, that's not a that's not a command. I think that's where the majority of the um, married comedians, um, mm. you know, oh well, my <laughs> wife's you know said this, and it's sort of like yeah, but I know because of what I know that you're supposed to do that because of that, you know. And it's but funny. Yeah, it, would be, it would be nice funny. if everyone just kind of said, hey, can you do this? Because, like you said, for us, you know, it is literally the difference between whether it gets done or not. Yeah, like, I mean, it's it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a cue. Like, this needs to be done at this time. And then we're going through our, our uh, schedule in our heads or on paper. And then we're just like, okay, I can fit it in right here and I'll prioritize it. But, like, for me, if somebody asks me politely to do something and I'm not doing something, like, very time sensitive or very urgent and they asked me danielle can you do this for me i will like go out of my way to do it because of the way they asked me because of the way like i like i won't even i won't even waffle i'll just be like okay goes to do it but like i'm not gonna just like not do it either but it's just it's just like right. i feel so much more included in that conversation that I just I just feel happier and more motivated to do that thing and like I'm listened to right. and it sounds like because like you are such a good self-advocate and you're married like so I'm sure you tell your your wife and that she's always like looking to uh take notes she just seems that way based on your comics that um like when you you obviously tell her like well these things don't work these things do work and then she follows up like she she'll go into the store with you so people won't give you weird looks you know right although it's not okay she, that they do that well she um she's been known to read what i write or or watch you know read my comics and then i'll notice her implementing changes um that's the best way to show love isn't and it and i'm just like um well the, the changes are on me no i'm kidding Oh, uh, it's halfway. No, Everybody's no, gonna go halfway. She, you know, <laughs> she makes things. Uh, she makes things easier. Like she's she's actually been blunt about something that I needed her to be blunt about because I wasn't getting it done. And I kind of <laughs> looked at her, and she was like, "That's right, I know." You know, <laughs> I, you know I I looked into it, or I saw what you said. Um. But you know, it's really funny. There's certain things that she does that there's just no way that I could do like she you know all logan likes to play in the spice cabinet move stuff around and of course so then it's not in the way that it was before um and then she'll just every single time you know we'll come back to it and it's right back to the way it was like some kind of weird twilight zone episode <laughs> but it's sort of like when it comes to like organizing the pantry or organizing the spice cabinet or or cleaning up a certain way that's always been one of my uh follies i guess where I want it done. I want to get done with it, but I'm not sure how to how to stack things and do stuff like that. So, um, a side tangent, I guess, of it's really nice to have um, two different sets of skills, you know, to help um, to help bridge that gap. But yeah, she definitely takes notes. She definitely um, goes out of her way to, you know find a way to reach, you know, find a way to reach me and go, okay, you know, this is, you you need to do this or you need to do, you know. Um, so she, when it comes to like, take the trash out, she, you know, you need to take the trash out, you, you know, 
And I'm like, okay, you know, and I go do it. Um, but yeah, back at my house when I was living with my family, it was sort of like there's eight of us and somebody would go, the trash is overflowing. Yeah, good for the trash. You know? <laughs> cool. um, but yeah, anyway. Um, so yeah, she's she's definitely um, been really helpful with that, and um, I think you can I think you can get that that sort of um, you know a lot of people are are saying I'll oh, I'll only date an autistic person because I'm autistic, and some people are like well, you know I'll only date a neurotypical person or I'll only you know go this direction or or whatever. Yeah. And I think um, I think all of those can work really well. Yeah, it's uh, like you know you said uh, we all say if you've met one autistic person, you met one autistic person. The same thing goes to neurotypicals. Right. Though so, I think sometimes people's experiences kind of stigmatize certain roles in their heads. You know, like neurotypicals tend to respond this way. Turn neurotypicals tend to respond that way. But like. What happens when they realize, you know, you know, there's a bridge to fix uh, and a bridge to work through like that, like in any relationship, there will be bridges to work through, Mm -hmm. but it's a matter of the commitment. There's not going to be more or less work based on, based on who you're dating. There's just, some people will get it. Some people won't. And honestly, it doesn't. And some people will. We'll have to work harder to understand you, but it. Some people just are naturally quirky, whether or not they're autistic, and it just might be like, "Hey, uh, I'm, I'm still working to understand you." Like I've had, sh- shout out to several of my friends who are not autistic, who, outright, you know, like looked up ASD or asked me what I think. And that's very validating, don't you think? Right. Um, well, see, I think I got a little bit lucky in her case that um, <clears throat> I think about the time we started going out was about the time that I realized for the second time that I was autistic. Um, I was diagnosed as a kid and it sort of was swept under the rug and, and not really talked about. Um, and then when I found out again, it was sort of in the midst of no one will hire me. I have a college degree and no one cares. Yeah. Um, and she... When we first met, um, we just kind of locked eyes, and it was uh, one of two of my best friends that was their cousin, and she just saw me as like a quirky, nerdy, bad boy type, you know, and was like, "Hey, you know, there you go." And I don't know. I think sometimes the idiosyncrasies match a little bit mm. when, you know, because she's not um, she's. She's not with them either, you know. She's not with the neurotypical people in in a lot of different ways. She she likes to distance herself from from society in a way as well. So I think with us, it's sort of like we have our friends, we have our family, and um, we keep to ourselves most of the time. And I think that's I think similarities that people have, regardless of neurotype, are going to be the glue that that brings them together and that holds them together. I think neurotype when it comes to dating um, is literally like you're saying, it's literally just these small bridges that just need to be worked on. And if you refuse to work on them, then it, yeah, it's not going to work. Yeah. It's going to end badly. Them. Right. And that's, that's regardless of neurotype. The, the, it's not more issues because of the difference between the two. It's the same issues in a different way. The hmm. same amount of issues in a and different you know, there are some people uh, who are neurotypical who I relate to way better than some people who are artistic and vice versa. Right. And, you know, it's easy to get into that idea, like, of, well, I'm never going to marry somebody who is on the autism spectrum because you might think, oh, well, I don't want to marry somebody exactly like me. But, like, you know, they might be nothing like you. They might, you might be a star wars fan and they might be a what's the opposite of star trekkie. wars <laughs> trekkie <laughs> trekkie yeah a trekkie i'm not I, into I, that type of thing but you know that's that's up to that person you know and it's right. up to the person 
to find their match and not, I mean, I think it's important to not worry about neurotype except right. to consider whether or not, like, okay, look at at the, this person's specific neurotype and how it meshes with you. Like, look at this person, then look at you, then talk. Talk for six months, talk for eight months, talk for a year. Then think about, you know, maybe dating or getting married if you're already dating. But, like, actually figure out if, you know, this this can mesh with you. Because, like, 99.9% .9 of the time when relationships end, it's, it's not because one person was a jerk and the other person was not a jerk. It was because it... it it, it was because one person didn't mesh with the other person. That's a two-way street. And uh, it's it's about a good fit. It's not about good person, bad person. Just not a good fit. And that mm -hmm. happens sometimes, even with two beautiful people. Which, as you know from reality shows like my wife watches, that happens a lot. <laughs> We're cheaters, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't remember what show. Um, I want to say Laguna Beach. I'm probably way off. But there's this one where they're just sitting around being rich and complaining about <laughs> stuff. And one guy, it was just sort of like very vapid, shallow, you know, and then his ex, his now ex is confronting him and saying, why are you over there talking to your ex? You know, sh you know, she, Stephanie, blah, blah, blah. And his response was, Steph, uh, I mean, you know, whatever your name is, like called her the wrong name. And I'm going, okay, well, good luck with that. <laughs> Hashtag but, divorce. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's funny. Yeah, she watches that stuff. And I watch it because... Um, People watching has always, you know, I think that's a lot of our thing because we have to learn from them how to mimic them. And, of course, obviously, the new the take the mask off thing, that's what we need to strive for. But many of us were talking about how we grew up and, and had to mask for safety or for fitting in or to get the job or whatever. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, people watching for me has always, has always been fun. And it's sort of like, this is, you know, it's, you know, if you go to Walmart, you get a certain, <laughs> a certain group of people. If you watch reality shows, you get a certain group of people. So it's funny to just see them and mimic them. And Candace will get really annoyed because I'll just, <laughs> I'll start mimicking their voices and how they talk and their cadence and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> Because there's, you know, there's different personality traits that I just find hilarious. There was one guy who, um, his grandmother cut him out of his, his fund, whatever it is. And he went to get a job with a family friend. And he was like, I'm going to be honest. I have no reason to be here. I'm just trying to get back in my grandmother's fund. And I'm sort of like, wow. Do you hear you? You know what I mean? This is so weird. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, uh, yeah, people watching is hilarious for that reason. Not to, again, side tangent, which is obviously... No, it's, it's, it's fun for me, too. It's, it truly is. And it's, and it's something I can definitely relate to, uh, you know, in learning how to, how to, literally how to act and how to do comedy. Like, and uh, it's, it's how people, it's how... I think I think it's how everybody learns initially. It's just about what opportunities do they get? Like, do they get the opportunities to learn from uh, their caregivers growing up? Do they get opportunities as adults? And how how does their um, how does that impact what you know what they're already born with? You know, and then. Sometimes it's just like it's almost like uh, the nail in the coffin. Then you get a you get a diagnosis later. Obviously, autism that it's there from birth, but like you don't you get the diagnosis or you don't based on how you end up later. You know, if you can if you don't look look autistic as we all hate that, 
then you don't tend to get the diagnosis, especially because psychologists, psychiatrists are resistant to giving that diagnosis or they just don't know enough. Well, that's, I, I think the thing is, every time I've ever gone in for any diagnosis, they look at the textbook definition and refuse to mm. deviate from it. And when I got re-diagnosed, it was to get help with um, job seeking through uh, DARS, D D Department of Rehabilitative Services. I think they changed the name here in Texas. But um, they said, we're not going to help you because you don't have a diagnosis. And I'm like, well, except I do from a kid. And they're like, yeah, but we don't see it. So get, get re-diagnosed. Well, I go in to get re-diagnosed, and the guy's like, you look normal. And I'm like, well, don't use that word. Um, but I had to almost renegotiate based on my growth, my experiences growing up and focus on that more than how I am now. I said, no, what you're seeing is what I want you to see. I said, you need to realize that I said, I'm part of this community, you know, in a way already, we, you know, we, we put in all this work to act neurotypical specifically so you can just go, well, you're not autistic. Um, and that is, that is the, the problem, you know, you've seen my Aspie meme, Oh, yeah. deal where it's like puts puts in all the work to to mimic neurotypicals through painstaking you know whatnot Effort, and at the yeah. bottom it's like is disregarded as an autistic person because of it um, yeah and that's that's the catch-22 it's sort of like we if those of us who grew up undiagnosed forced ourselves to fit in so we didn't get bullied i mean i literally had people ready to kill me growing up um, and they didn't even know why they just had this look in their face like I hate you and I don't I don't understand it um, and so of course you do everything you can to fit in and to not um, and to not stick out and that literally is masking and then you go in to get a diagnosis as an adult and they go no you don't have a robot voice <laughs> you can make facial expressions exactly you, know, you understood my joke and I'm like okay but that's because your joke was funny Right, you, you're don't your flatter yourself. Right, your archetype is wrong. We we use voice intonation. We make facial expressions. Of course, we're doing it for you, and at some point, it becomes second nature. But like, I had to school this guy. I was like, no, dude, you don't get it. You don't even get that you don't get it. Like, you're looking you at a paragraph. You don't understand in, that you don't understand. Right, <laughs> Dunning Kruger. You know what I mean? Like, you're looking at a paragraph in a book and judging an entire neurotype based on this paragraph uh, um oh well, let's see here white male well you got that part you know like dude come yeah on. how how much do i have to be like an eight-year-old boy for you to actually believe me right i um, know an eight-year-old white boy um playing with trains play right. uh lining them up um make it calling one of them thomas like color just, coding them right. color coding them you know, like fidget these, spinners weren't a thing at that or time. Or like, yeah, yeah. But at if the same were, time, it, we would require that too, apparently. Right, and you know, uh, sarcasm. The worst part about that was like I had not slept in forty-eight hours. I had not eaten dinner or breakfast the next morning because I was pretty angry at the world at that point. I was sort of like, okay, no one's giving me a job. I've had this degree for a while, you know. Um, there were issues in me and Candace's relationship because she lived an hour away and I can't afford gas, you know what I mean? Cause no one, no one's hiring me. Um, and I go in there and then this guy's just flat out like, nah, I'm, that's I'm like, heartbreaking. I'm like, then, no, not that's nah. a prerequisite. So, that's a prerequisite for you to get what you need. Right. Like the diagnosis, like that's right. And a, lo and a lot of people, it's just, they're going for a diagnosis and that's hurtful enough. But when you figure that your entire life is hanging in the balance, I was like, no, not, not. I, yeah. like, I can give you a thousand plus scenarios in my head of why not, nah. Yeah. Like if you don't fit in, in Christian school or public school, or homeschool. You know oh, I mean? yeah. I can relate um, to that, too. It's like, oh, like the some of the most stressful time, one of the most stressful times of my life in grad school, like my insurance got cut because they didn't receive my, my documents to renew. And uh, now 
you know, now it's, you know, a fight to get them, get that sorted. And that hangs on everything else, like, you know, therapy, uh, making sure that I have, you know, new glasses. It's like, it's like, there's my autism hashtag me too story. Uh, let's talk about that for the next couple minutes and then we'll wrap up. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and that, that, that's the thing is I think a, a lot of us are, are being, I mean, you've seen some of my struggles with, with doctors late, lately. Every I, I spent all last year and kind of the year before that trying to figure out my autoimmune issues and, mm-hmm. you know, like my comic, um, Dr. Any Man's uh, Hypochondriac or Drug Seeker. I saw that one. You know, I love it's, it. It's sort of like I go in and it's sort of like a, hey, roll the dice. You know, you're either a hypochondriac or a drug seeker. And I, they all come to the same conclusion. And then, of course, they backpedal as soon as you call them on it. Oh, no, 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 not at all. And um, one of them uh, it was a doctor who looked like Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> sort of like a drier, um, cleaner hair version. He was just like. <laughs> Well, I think you need to reconsider the fact that you're allergic to plants. And I'm like, okay. Well, I'll see you next time after I eat something that I'm not supposed to. And almost so, die. Right. So I came in and I, I literally went and got um, breakfast somewhere. And it was cooked in peanut oil. It had jelly on it. It had honey on it. And it was a biscuit. So, of course, it's rolled in flour. So all of these things are straight up poison for me. So my lip is split and, you know, I take physical damage from plants. So my lip is literally swollen and split and cut. And there's, you know, I'm bleeding a little bit. And I, I came into his appointment and he was like, oh, uh, so something, something happened there. Yeah. I ate something I wasn't supposed to, you know, and yeah. And he's like, well. Why'd you do that? I was like, because you're an idiot. Because you decided not to believe me. Like, I, I could go get a banana. We could have a, we could have a freaking fun time. You know what Just, I mean? like, shove that in your eyeball socket. Right. Like, well, I mean, if it, not literally, really. if a banana just touches my lip, it would, it would swell up. Um, and, and it's just, it's so hard. I feel like there's so many gatekeepers when it comes to, the medical world and obviously they have to be because of you know there are drug seekers and there are hypochondriacs and there are things like that the problem is that we as autistic people are experiencing that accusation at a higher level i feel than anybody else um i mean they just don't take your word for it i literally got a, t- a test for autoimmune disorders and it was uh i had a positive ana which means you have an autoimmune disorder and he goes, I think it's a false positive. I'm like, cool. Well, um, yeah. Like, I, that's adorable that you would say that. However, that's I can't eat a salad. You know what I mean? Like, I can't breathe around open bananas. <laughs> you, you're not getting it. Um, and I, I understand. I'm an extreme case. It took me 25 years to find what I am, much to believe it. Um, but when I started recognizing as a kid, I was underweight. And um, it was food avoidance, but they thought it was texture-based. Like, you know, like an autistic kid, like a normal autistic mm-hmm. person. They thought it was like, oh, he just doesn't like the feeling or whatever. No, I was literally avoiding foods that were causing me pain and making me sick. And... Um, you know, it took me, I understand that their disbelief is sort of like, I've never heard of this disease, um, mm-hmm. you know, oral allergy syndrome. But when I'm like, okay, you have the drug work, like you have the lab that says that I am this way, and you're still telling me no. It's sort of like, I don't, I don't understand. And then they say, um, well, even if you are, there's nothing we can do to help you. When it turns out there's a medication that I, I recently almost died from, somebody spiked my noodles, uh, soba noodles, with orange juice a um, couple months ago. And I, I literally was, you know, had foam and allergic reaction stuff. And I go into this um, 
urgent care and he just writes he just jabbed me with something and uh, I felt amazing I felt better than I ever had and I'm like I nearly just died but I feel the best I've ever had in my life what did you just do he was like well he's like I gave you Benadryl but I also gave you this other thing and of course I can't think of it right now but it's specifically for autoimmune disorders it's the same medication that they give people who just had a transplant from someone else mm. it stops your body from overreacting to what it sees as threats because of course my body thinks everything's a threat um but he wrote me a prescription for it and i was on it for about a week and i was like i was sort of like is is the negative side effect of this drug being pessimistic and angry or am i pessimistic <laughs> and angry because this drug has existed this entire time um like i really had to sit there and think about it because i was talking to a coworker, and he was like you sound a little dark right now and i'm like well i'm kind of mad because this doctor basically told me no we've had this drug since the 50s you know this has been around forever they could have given you this at any time and i understand that the the um drawback of that drug you could get moon face or you could get you know diabetes you can get any of these different things it's it's a very high you know one of those commercials where the third of the commercial is the negative side effects but at the same time yeah. it's like this is life changing and again the gatekeepers were like no nah, you don't you don't get that you can't have that yeah. so um i think coming to a diagnosis is the same deal there it's like a gatekeeper deal where they don't even have the the right you know the right script to know if we're telling the truth because right. they're they're trying to find a one size fits all well, let's see here. Do you enjoy mac and cheese and chicken nuggets and light trains? Oh, and you know? are those dino chicken nuggets or are they right. Thomas the Tank Engine chicken nuggets? Trick question. Autistic people don't care. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I think um, the the medical community, whether it's psychiatric, whether it's medical, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, they, they seriously... <sighs> They seriously need to do a better job of, yeah, obviously screen out the drug seekers, obviously screen out the hypochondriacs, but obviously pay attention to different neurotypes and realize that we often mimic people who have bad intentions just because fidgeting, no eye contact, things like that, where I'm trying to tell you what I need, but I'm looking away from you. Um, that's not us lying. That's us trying to maintain comfortability and your presence to get what we need. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think uh, first of all, do a little more research in the autism community before you, you know, if you're giving out diagnosis for autistic people, talk to aut actually autistic people who have been diagnosed and yeah. go, oh, I am wrong about my assumption. Um, I actually have a psychoanalyst in my life who I've had to correct several times and say, that's not really what we do. Yeah. Or, maybe, you know, that, that's not maybe, the end of it. Maybe hire some autistic people on your board to help uh, screen people for autistic traits and then have a doctor uh, or a you know licensed professional do the actual assessment. I mean, you don't, I mean, I'm of the opinion you don't need a degree to see a duck when it's a duck if you are a seasoned duck. duck looker. Right. If you're a if you're a duck, like you don't need to be an ornithologist or whatever it's called to, to go, oh yeah, that's a duck. Um because yeah. you're like, if oh it no, looks that's like a duck, acts like a duck, talks right. like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And it's safe to say, unless there's unless it's a like a goose or, or a duck imposter, it's right. probably a duck. Right, exactly. Um, and, you know, luckily, I think uh, I know quite a bit of people who are working towards being uh, being in the chair of a diagnostic you know, person, which would be great, because I think the number one story I hear is, can't get a diagnosis, nobody believes me. Um, yeah. But as an autistic person, I've met people who found out they were autistic years later, mm. and we do that thing where you just kind of go... You know, the Spider-Man meme where he's pointing at himself. Um, you re we, we recognize it. You know, there is not an autistic look, right? And we all agree with that. And what that means is 
there's not a single race, there's not a single gender, there's not a single, you know, personality, there's not, you know, certain things like that. But there is a way that we present ourselves almost um, non, almost, I would say nonverbal, where we do pick up on it. I feel like even if we don't know what we're picking up on, we do know. Yeah, it's instinctual know, for us. You know? Yeah. Because um, I've met several people um, in the last few years where I was like, I, I made it awkward. I mean, I was sort yeah. of like, huh, what? You know, and their their friends like, why? What, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, nothing. You know, and then months, months, years later, they're like, hey, I just found out that I'm autistic. And I'm like, ha ha, you know, there it is. That's yeah. What it, that's what that was. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so, like yeah, I he- think. I think the way that people in the spectrum sort of like, like we we don't get why we get things. It's just it's just like we might like wake up in the middle of the night and be like, oh, Johnny oh, James, okay. Joey James is in trouble. I better text him. And then it turns out that he had like a nightmare too or something. Mm-hmm. And like you you know you need to call him. And then you know it's like we don't understand. Like neurotypical people will be able to like be like. Okay, I, because you said this, 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 it's probably this, but like, we just have these gut feelings that are just like, it's almost, it's separate from narrative because I feel like, I feel like, you know, and then well, people think, look at us like we're crazy that we make the, all these intuitive leaps. Right. Well, I've, and that's the thing is I've always felt wolf-like, animalistic, however you want to put it, and, and not animalistic as in savage, but animalistic <laughs> as in intuitive, as in deep in thought constantly. And I think the predictive nature for us is sort of like we want to know what we're going to run into. Um, and and for myself, I literally have had, if if I believed in psychics, you know what I mean? It was like... How could I possibly know that? Mm. Um, and it it gets it gets that strong. Of course, I'm empathic as well. So mm. you know that math is all just going through my head, and then my brain just sort of spits out a little little ticker tape, and then you read it and you go, oh, okay, that person is not having a great day right now, even though they're yeah. doing really well at hiding it. Um, you know, I've I've been notorious for for knowing. Um, for knowing things about people that they don't know about themselves. Yeah. Meanwhile, missing things about myself, you know what I mean? Yeah. That are, that are huge deals. But Yeah. We yeah, got to Yeah, we got to predict- wrap up in a second. Yeah. But I'm sorry for cutting you off. But oh, um no. we we got to wrap this up, but I really want to thank you for um being on the show and I really want to invite you back again cuz this has been like a great talk. Um I want to let the audience know that um, I am still accepting applications every so often for, um, autistic guest speakers or just gen- general guest speakers. You can find out more on my website at www.drcomedian.com. Thank you so much for coming on, Nathan. We'll see, hope to see you again soon. Yeah, I appreciate you having Sorry me. Sorry for the premature cutoff. No, nah, it's all right. Okay, bye. All right, thanks.